Rogers. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode, and we're going to be talking about something that comes up more and more frequently lately. I hear people talking about this all the time, so we said, you know what, we just need to tackle this head on, and we're talking about IT-OT convergence. And to have that conversation, we brought in an expert. We brought in Michael Manzi, who is the Manufacturing Information Systems Practice Lead at Fine Zelstra. So welcome, Michael. Thank you, Chris. I'm excited to have you. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm just doing ducky. I'm feeling good today. <laughs> feeling like ready to talk about IT and OT. Exciting topic. <laughs> Exciting topic. Exciting. It's, it's really coming up more and more. I was just in a plant yesterday, and and, and this topic came up. And you know, I have a I have a, a some younger kids, and one of them's in middle school. And maybe help me if I needed to explain it to her. You know, she's a sixth grader about what IT and OT is. How would you How would you start defining that? Well, I would say, you know, to start off just uh, in general, IT deals with more of the business side of a company where OT, operational technology, deals with the machinery that runs on the plant floor uh, and actually making the product. Uh, very similar, uh, symbiotic, um, use a lot of the same technologies, but uh, to put it into a school of terms that a middle schooler would understand, think of uh, the administration at the middle school, like a principal, the secretary, uh, they have a job to do and they're in charge of the teachers and the teachers are in charge of teaching. The administrators don't teach, but the teachers do. So OT would be the teachers. They're the ones actually running the machines or teaching the kids versus the uh, administrators, which need to run the building. And part of that is making sure the teachers are hitting the marks that they need to hit. So they need reports from the teachers of how is the class doing? Is the class on track? You know, or what's the average grade? They don't need to know minute by minute, you know, is Johnny sitting at his desk? Is, is Sally, you know, um, paying attention? Um, they just need to know key process indicators, like such as average, uh, the average grade of the class. Uh, what was the attendance today and to that degree? Right. I think that's the best analogy I've ever heard of, of comparing ITOT. I mean, that, that really painted such a, a great picture. And, you know, I know we're talking about, you know, you live in the OT world a lot as well. And I'm just trying to maybe help our, our, our listeners understand that picture of how does IT see what you do in process control? What, where, what is their view? Uh, we're the wild west of networking. <laughs> the wild um, west. There, there, are, there are no rules. Uh, they see it like, uh, I'm mean, using an old reference here, Thunderdome. Okay. Um, you know, uh, and, and to a large degree, they're not incorrect. Um, you know, because in the, in the OT world, our machines have to run. We can't afford downtime. Um, and a lot of us learned IT on our own. Um, we didn't get formal training. We just had this machine that all of a sudden was capable of working on a network and we network it to another machine. Hey, there's this thing called a switch. Well, I'm going to get this unmanaged one because I don't want to take the time to learn how to work a managed switch. I just want my machines to run. And, and, so you'll see a lot of organic growth in process control networks, which is a common term for operational technology networks. And, and within that, it's just, there's no structure, um, very poor record keeping, um, uh, poor security practices. You know, they, they just want things to work. They want to be able to get help when they need it. So there really is no thought in, um, into how people access that network, mm -hmm. uh, limitations on it, how it's structured and, um, in a modern world, it's led to some problems because now the OT world needs to interact with the IT world. Um, you know, everybody has heard about the Internet of Things and manufacturing 4.0, um, and, and th that's where the convergence is now happening. Yeah. Now, it, since you guys are the wild, wild west, if you're in that IT, you know, what, what, what's their perception, right? Com you know, speak to their side. How, do they, how are they viewing you? Well, it's actually how we view them because they, they view us as, you know, almost ignorant um, okay. and to, to IT practices. And, and, and they are formally trained on networking quite often. They hold, you know, certifications from Microsoft, from Cisco, and, and they understand how data packets really move, how switches are set up, how to limit, you know, cyber storms, um, how to control the remote access in, in a safe way. Uh, when OT looks at them, though, they're overly restrictive because, you know, in our mind, the machines have to run. And if you're not enabling us to run the factory, you're, you're not helping the factory. 
So uh, common thought processes, you know, I, I would use to sum up how I saw IT is they think the factory was made for their networks uh, and that they weren't enabling the, the plant floor to be successful. Right. And that started, you know, we started having these conversations 15 or 20 years ago and it was oil and water. Um, and it was two people talking a similar language with dissimilar interests and, and some of the terminology where we thought we were saying the same thing actually meant different things. Right. Right. So, I mean, it, it dates back that, that long ago to when it all started hitting the plant floor, huh? Well, once you had uh, MES systems, uh, manufacturing execution systems come into play, probably in the late nineties, early two thousands, um, you know, business people said, Hey, I can actually get these reports, you know, and get and see up within the hour or within the minute, what my plant floor is doing. I want more of that. Right. So everybody thinks this IOT stuff is brand new. Manufacturing 4.0 is brand new. Um, it's just the same stuff uh, re-termed um, and packaged differently. It's uh, You see more, a lot of more IT presence on the plant floor. You're seeing Microsoft come down on the plant floor. You're seeing ERP systems come down on the plant floor. And a lot of other third-party players uh, trying to redefine um, the, the, dat- the known data flows of the control systems. Right. And just a new terminology for what is essentially the same thing that we've been doing for 20 years. Now, when I was doing some research to get ready to, to talk with you, because it's, it's definitely, you're an expert. I want to make sure we go where you want. I ran across some things called the CIA triad and how that is viewed, you know, from the OT world and IT world. And there's definitely different priorities and you've already spoke to some of that. So maybe th- break that down for our listeners so they can, they can understand when you mean the priorities are different for IT and OT, what, what, what are you actually referring to there? There's several areas where we differ on, on, on how we view our networks. Um, and, and I, I've stressed earlier that our machines got to run. And, um, one of the things I pose to young engineers or when I go into a new factory or something, I said, what, what do we make here? And if I was at, you know, a paint company, the first answer I, you know, expect to hear is doesn't say paint. If I'm at a machining company, uh, you know, drill bits, um, you know, hammers, or, or if I'm at a, a car company, cars, I'm like, tell them they're all wrong. Every plant makes the same thing. They make money and they make product to make money and the machine makes the products. So if the machines are not making products, the company is not making money. Right. If the company is not making money. We don't have jobs. Yep. Um, so on the plant floor, our top priority is availability. The machines need to run. On the IT side, they're connected to the outside world. They're worried about confidentiality, security, um, yeah, and, and that they could, availability is their third priority. Where availability, you know, availability is a top priority of the OT side, where confidentiality is the bottom priority. And when you don't understand that, it's, uh, you don't understand the cultures, you then have, and you go to war right. without understanding why, right? Because we're, we're both not helping each other because yeah. we have different interests. Big time, big time, different interests there. So I mean that that middle. So is the middle layer of integrity. Is that is that viewed the same equally for IT and OT, or is that even considered? Yeah, and the, you know, we, we, you know, like it says, like availability for for process control is probably the highest, and then you know, in, integrity is kind of in line with that. Is the system has to deliver good data, reliable data, mm-hmm. um, and and that we we actually do have common ground, um, okay. and, and that's a good place to start from, uh, and, and 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 you got to come approach the conversation and um, and and not come at it as oil and water. You need to do this for us, or else, right. or we're not going to do this for you. It's just. Hey guys, and that's why I start off with the we all we want the company to make money, right? And and we're, we're all playing in the same sandbox now. We're on networks, so you do things better than we do in certain aspects, and and we understand what we need to get done. We need you to help you help us enable ourselves to be successful, right? And and you need to understand, you know, on your end, you know what our priorities are that these machines need to run, yeah. and I can't have you randomly patching stuff causing downtime on my network. So we have to come up with a mutually agreeable solution that protects both our interests. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Now, when you talked about the, the plants that you, the industry 4.0 smart manufacturing, 
Uh, we're moving so much data now and that data traffic, you know, maybe that could be an issue that causes some, some conflict there. So what are the types of data that you guys are looking at moving around and managing and how are they different from the IT world versus the OT world? And now you're at a big crux of the argument. Okay. This is, um, you know, uh, I've, I've crossed this bridge many times. Um, so let's say company A CEO, he wants to get some of this industry 4.0. He went to a seminar. He wants to modernize. Hey, I want this IoT. And he looks at it and he sees a computer. He sees reporting stuff. You know, he sees data collection. And who does he know that does that? And hey, you know, my uh, ERP guys, my IT guys, you know, they fix my iPhone. They fix my computer. They know how to, you know, they know the internet stuff. They know how to do data. So they, they ask their, their IT or, you know, CIO or their IT. So, and this isn't everybody. I'm just taking just a, you know, a general use case here. You know, there are some people that are more savvy in some areas and it's changing over time. People are getting more educated, but uh, the IT guys deal with the business side of the world. So when they look at uh, a reporting system, they're, work, they're, they're typically dealing with an ERP style system, a business reporting system. Mm-hmm. And they're used, those systems are used to receiving data and every hour, maybe once a day, no more than, once a minute or every 10 minutes. So right. when it goes to file a, you know, a process, a daily report, it's looking at hundreds of points of data to compile. Right. Um, and they're, they're, usually those systems are telling you what happened yesterday, what happened last week. Rear view, looking back. Right. Yes. When we deal with uh, an OT system, the MES systems, and even to the IOT systems now, this is where the difference is. It's the amount and velocity of the data. Um, say like a press control system, I've written uh, monitoring systems and analytic systems on that where I'm collecting data at 10 to 15 milliseconds. That can be millions of points a day. And that's just one data point. Wow. So let's say press speed could be a million data points a day. So a business system, many of them, when they, when they try to process that amount of data, mm-hmm. will, you know, will time out. Uh, or we'll return the report six hours later. Right. Um, it, it's just, it, 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 they're not built to handle that magnitude and velocity of, of data. So when I also, one thing that keeps coming up, in, even in our company, I'm, I'm getting this more and more, the, the topic of cybersecurity. And I'm curious from your standpoint, you know, it, it seems like that's a really big deal for our, our, our IT um, engineers out there, that cybersecurity topic. Is it that big a deal for the OT? Just wondering where they come together there. It wasn't. Okay. Um, and this is an, uh, one of the ways that OT needs to listen uh, okay. to IT because they've been dealing with outside connections for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Um, in the OT world, you were generally air-gapped. You had a machine, had some network with internal, but it wasn't connected to anything. Maybe you connect that to another machine, another machine, and it wasn't connected to the outside world. Right. Um, and, and then now... It is uh, in, 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 a, in a modern, mature system. So when we look at that, you know, we're like, what's the danger? You know, I, I put a password on it. The, you know, the data moving is encrypted. I'm safe. And you're not. Um, you know, there's, there's people that spend their whole day figuring out how to decrypt things, how to, how to get through passwords. Um, and, and you look at typical uh, cybersecurity uh, stories, you know, I, I always point to the one from Target, you know, 10, yeah. 15 years ago, they had an HVAC system, had a remote access system on it so that the HVAC supplier could help them maintain the HVAC system. Yeah. And that's where the hackers got in. They got into an HVAC system, into a fan, basically got on the network and stole everybody's credit card information. It's crazy. And yeah, and it's, um, that's a routine, uh, um, issue you need to own you know your remote access you need to monitor it you need to uh be in charge of it um there's a lot of third-party remote access systems um and they're convenient they're easy to use and when you look at good better best is kind of a term i used it's probably good there you know it's got password protection you open the connection um you know you can close it yourself but ultimately you don't own the connection Right. Some third party, you know, uh, app, you know, appliance out in the cloud somewhere or somewhere else is brokering that connection for you. Mm-hmm. And, and if you're going to be proactive in your cybersecurity, you need to own that connection. Good point. Has this, has this started being an increasing more 
uh, relevant topic with COVID, work from home, people wanting to get data you know, from the manufacturing floor. Everybody wants to enable remote access, not only uh, for their, their own users, um, but for remote support. These machines are getting more complicated, more technical, uh, harder support. And in some cases, you know, OEMs will refer to their machines as um, intellectual property. So you're not allowed to access the PLC programs. You're not allowed to see what's going on. Uh, so you need, you were reliant on them for, for support. Yeah. Um, and they offer a lot of the, they all offer their own remote access package. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them even, you know, we, we got our own cellular technology. We, we'll just add it on there and it, uh, it'll send you your, we'll, we'll instantly be able to connect to your machine. Right. Um, and maybe in some small factories where it's a machine that connected to a network. Fantastic. You know, right. that's great. Uh, in a mature factory with with it all networked and that network's connected to your business network, you've just created a, a cyber problem. Right. Good point. I mean, we're, we're hearing more and more OEMs, just like you said. That is, that's their preferred method of support, you know, to have that remote connectivity, you know, versus the old days of, you know, flying a technician out to, to somewhere to, to reset something. They, these, these OEMs are really pushing that remote. So your, your advice is to, to own that process no matter what. Well, and the ratio of machines to um, what I would say capable engineers, uh, it, that, that ratio is getting higher and higher and higher and not in the good direction. Right. Um, so how do you, with a finite level of resources and of, of engineers capable of supporting and an ever increasing number of machines to support, mm -hmm. remote access is, is critical and, 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 a, and a must have, and, and you need to do it correctly. And, you know, another term I like to use is, you know, I talk to people is your, cybersecurity doesn't happen by accident. Mm -hmm. You have to think through this. There is a whole bunch of phase zero stuff in a modernization project of how am I going to structure my network? Where do I place my firewalls? How do I, how am I segmenting my network? How do I allow access? Who can access? What level of security? It's not just you put, uh, you know, an antivirus program out there. In a lot of cases, OT Networks don't like antivirus program programs because they shut down the network. They shut down machines. Uh, and again, it goes against our, our top priority of availability. Um, there's, there's a whole separate suite of OT monitoring products um, that, uh, that, and also on OT systems, you will see that windows are not updates are not done to the second. You're lucky in, in a good system. Maybe they're done quarterly, six months, a year. Right. There's some systems out there that haven't been done ever. Um, and, and they're afraid that the update is going to break the software. Right. Um, and in many cases it has in the past. And, you know, it, once you hit, hit yourself in the head with a hammer once to do it a second time, I believe it's called insanity or something like that. That's right. That's right. Now let's, let's, let's take it back to the plant for a second as well. What, so say something fails on the OT network and then let's conversely, let's talk about something that fails on the IT network. How are they treated differently? You know, is, is that is so far as replacements, upgrades, and things like that? So that's another uh, high area of difference. Okay. Um, and, and then the big thing there is mean time to repair. Okay. Um, and, and again, it goes back to the availability of the network. It's critical on the OT side. And, and everything well, on the OT side, minutes count, seconds count. So, you know, anything over minutes or hours is devastating. Um, it's, 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 you shut down production in what's the cost per hour of not producing stuff. You're costing the company money, um, on the business side. So you didn't get your email for an hour yeah, and it's not as nearly as critical. So that's one thing it has to learn from OT is the criticality and how to keep up the resiliency of that network. You know, um, things like ring topologies, redundant stars, um, you know, having, you know, spare parts on the shelves, having a switch, hot switch on hot standby, um, are pre-configured, ready to be plugged in to replace another switch, you, you know, power cleaning UPSs, you know, these things need to be part of phase zero design. Okay. You know, what is the criticality of this network? And, and you have to think through it as to what is the proper architecture of it. Right. So, I mean, so you're saying too, the IT, sometimes that uh, speed to resolve could be delayed a little bit because like I said, you just, you may miss an email or things like that, whereas the OT doesn't have that. Is that, is that the ultimate rub between the two? Is that, 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 that speed to actually make the upgrade enhancements uh, and put those in place? One of them. Okay. 
<laughs> that is a big one. Uh, you know, it's just probably on the top five, top 10 list. Okay. Um, another big one is, you know, uh, controls engineers need to be empowered on the network. You, they need to be able to handle the data traffic, have machines talk to each other, be right. able to structure their databases, uh, uh, install software, uh, make changes. Um, and, and on a typical IT network, you tell IT, I want administrative rights on the network and I want to be an administrator on my PC and be able to do whatever I want to do on it, uh, see what reaction you get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're going to laugh you right out the plant. <laughs> That's right. So I like uh, one place I actually installed a SQL Server database and the IT guy um, made me uninstall it. He had to install it. And then, you know, and then he had to, I had to give him the schema for him to set up within it. And then I had to test it. And, and if something wasn't right, I had to send, submit a ticket for him to make a certain change. A day later, that change was made. I had to test it again. And then, okay, that this part works, but now this part doesn't. So I need you to make this change. So, uh, it's, so for an operation that should have taken 10 minutes, ended up taking 10 days. Wow. I mean, because you had to work through the ticket policies of it and, 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 and yeah, in, in that case, what we ended up doing is we had a big ITOT summit and, and that's really what every medium to large company should do. If you have, if you have it and OT departments, um, and you, you might not know you have an OT department, but you probably do. Uh, your, your maintenance supervisor, your controls engineer, your plant engineer, they might not have the official title of it, but they're responsible for the, those machines running. Yeah. And you got to sit down and talk about, you know, through situations, how are we going to handle this? You know, do I, you know, in one case, we separated the networks, we put in a DMZ zone, which I think is kind of funny because I talked about how the conflict happens between INT and OT. So we create this third network in between called the demilitarized zone. Right. Um, where we can pass data back and forth to each other, firewall on each side. But we went so far as to create a whole separate domain on the process control network that was the um, uh, responsibility of uh, the process control engineers. It was maintained by IT, but it, they, they empowered the process controls engineers to what I would call pseudo administrate. So we could add machines, remove machines, uh, you know, install programs, but we didn't have that power on the business network then since it was a separate domain. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so, I mean, the summit that you're talking about, that sounds like a great opportunity because my question was at that point, sounds like there's, there's no really common ground. So I'm trying to figure out how do we get common ground? And I guess that is just get people in a room, brainstorm, get them together, collect those ideas, share. And it takes strong leadership. Ah, there you go. You know, it, it, it takes a willingness from both sides and and strong leadership. And, and you know, you, you really need executive sponsorship really to to, to walk it through the process. Right. And because OT is busy, IT is busy, and, and you know, they kind of look at this as a hindrance to what their daily routine is. And they got to understand this is the future of the company. We have to figure this out. Now, those summits, you've mentioned phase zero several times today. So at those summits and those meetings and those engagements, is that a great place to start trying to, to lay some foundational work between the two? Absolutely. I mean, from you know, when you're having those summits, you're really going through uh, the needs and priorities of both sides. And, 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 and OT needs to learn how to be structured and IT needs to learn how to be let go of some of the control. And, and to enable to enable the machines to be available and running, and, and in there you, you you'll have to sit down and design you know the topology uh, uh, and, and and governance. So there's two sides to it. There's infrastructure and governance. Right. One is just you know how are we going to architect it, where the machines are, you know how, where the switch is going, what type of cabling are we going to use, you know, right. uh, and that's a difference too because office grade stuff versus industrial grade stuff is two different things. Right. Um, so there's two different suppliers, two different, you know, different players in those fields. Yep. Um, and then the governance side is how do we administrate this? And, and you got to figure out, you know, figure out where it makes sense. And, and what I found is from an OT side, um, a good approach uh, when talking to the IT is how do I make your job easier? Right. Because, you know, a lot of it, they're looking at this extra network that they have to, ha they have to take care of. And, and, and if they give us, freedom on it, then we're going to ruin it and it's going to create more work for them. Okay. And, but if you make it, you know, and, and, and you don't even have to lie about it. It's, it's, an, this is inevitable. Um, so 
we, we can either part, be partners with you and help you and, and reduce your workload, or we can continue just to be a hindrance to you. And it's just, this is going to happen. Now, let's stay right there. Let's say, just a quick analogy. You got your IT, who's the Yankees. You got your OT, who's the Red Sox. They're probably never going to get along. So at what point do you need to bring in a third party? And when that happens, who do you bring in? And, and you know, what what is the desired outcome of that, you know, kind of conflict resolution to bring the groups together? I was going Yankees and Rebels. <laughs> <laughs> Go blue and gray, right? There you uh, go. But Yankees, Red Sox works too. Whichever, whichever is more politically correct, I guess. Um, so yeah, you're right. Uh, so you got this strong leadership. You got this IT group. You got this OT group, and they really don't know how to talk to each other, right? Um, and and so we were successful at um, and when I was a corporate engineer, a global engineer for a couple companies, is we did bring in a third party um, that had OT specialists, IT and OT specialists that came in and arbitrated the discussion because they knew the areas that would be of, uh, that would cause friction and, and, and had actually gone through this journey multiple times and it can really enable the conversation. Think of it as a, a marriage council. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, couples can't talk to each other right. because they got different priorities and they right. don't know how to even engage in the conversation without getting into a fight. Um, and, but you, you bring in some, an arbitrator who, who knows what both sides want at the end of the day and, and, and lead them through that discussion. And you want it done in a way that you're not telling them what they need to do. Right. Uh, you, cause every plant is unique. Every company is unique and you need to respect that uniqueness. Um, you know, Sandler's sale training will tell you, don't put seagulls on people's paintings. Uh, but tell them there's something missing in the sky and describe a seagull to them. Right. Right. <laughs> That's uh, right. Now, and at, that's an approach at FZ. You know, is that, do you guys offer that type of consultation where you can come in and help bring those worlds together? Just know if you had any examples of, of what you, how you approach that. Yes. Uh, that, that is something that we do. Um, we do have consulting level services where we would come in and sit down and go through your user requirements. It's probably the first thing. This is all phase zero. Why are we doing this? What's the business case? Uh, we got to understand what we're trying to solve for you at the end of the day. And then if, once we got those requirements, do you need a recipe system? Do you, are you just trying to get just reports from your machines? Or is, is this, you know, um, legally critical? Are you making military grade stuff? Is this an explosive environment? You know, is there safety issues? We, we got to understand the, you know, the requirements of that particular facility and that company. Um, and then from there, you can logically uh, develop a network with uh, in a logical framework with modules that would be needed. And, and, and from there, you would then go into, you know, the physical structure of, okay, now we logically see this. How do we physically do it? And, and, and okay. that's how you walk through that conversation. But it all starts off with those user requirements. And, and I think that's where, you know, that arbitration comes in. And, 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 and once, once IT and OT are sitting at the table going through user requirements, it, it develops that partnership. They both right. see that they're able to help each other instead of hurting each other. Any commonalities from your experience where you've seen across multiple disciplines, IT and OT, where I'm trying to think through something that our users can take away and, and, and try to actually apply. You've talked physical a few times, so that physical layer. Just, just just wonder, are there any red threads that you'd like to throw out there to, hey, you've seen this working across multiple industries? So, um, you know, one of the things you'll talk through logically is a topology. And, and, and with that, it's, you know, um, how am I going to run the layer, you know, level three and level two uh, infrastructure through my plant. And so you would sit together, uh, the, the IT and OT teams talk about benefits and drawbacks of ring topologies and star topologies and, and mesh topologies, right. um, and, and even the wireless aspect of it as well. Um, and then you would sit there and where, where, what, what buildings do these switches go in? Um, where do we need to put in cabinets at places? What go, how do we construct these cabinets? So do we have put U, UPSs in? Do we need one UPS? Do we need two? Does it need to be a single switch, a redundant switch? Right. Uh, where do we need patch panels? Um, and this that definitely takes a collaboration between IT and OT to get that conversation done. Uh, and then you have a topology architecture. Great. 
Great, great examples. And I tell you what, for our listeners out there, you probably filled up uh, several pages of, of notebook paper taking notes listening to Michael. This is great stuff, Michael. And we always wrap up with the why. You, you really unpacked ITOT convergence, but let's get to that. So why is it so critical for IT and OT to come together? Because, I mean, we're all on this path together, right, for, to, towards 4.0. So uh, at some point, you know, we got to learn to play in the sandbox together. So what would be the why there? You know, you owe me money for using that one. <laughs> it's the same sandbox. But um, yeah, you, you, you've hit the nail on the head bit there. And, and, and you know, when I was working uh, for, an end, for end users, um, and one of the things I would say, you know, is when I, when I felt that we weren't or we're getting off track and, and starting to be conflicting again is if we don't do this now, we'll be doing this later with three different initials above this building. And, and it's inevitable. It's happening. Um, you know, it's modernization. Um, and we, when you know, one in particular, when we knew one of our com- competitors had actually moved significantly down that path and they were beating us uh, on, on uh, sales numbers across the board. We were competing them by 20%. And we did a little bit of math and the, the level of automation that they had took out about 20% of the cost of them to make the product. Wow. Wow. That's impactful. So if you want to compete in the modern world, you know, mo- modern problems cause, you know, require modern solutions. That's it. That's it. Well, Michael, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for our listeners out there. Check out the show notes. We'll make sure there's links out there to connect with Michael to FZ, the wonderful things that they're doing that support you on your, on your journey to smart manufacturing industry 4.0. So Michael, thank you again. And, and hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, Chris. This was a, a really great conversation. Wow, what a great conversation with Mike. I know what impacted me the most was hearing about the summit and bringing all the groups together to make better decisions to move forward. I want to remind everyone about the war stories. You can submit those on Facebook and Instagram, and that comes directly to us. And also, if you can help this podcast by giving us a five-star rating or write a simple one-sentence review, that would really help. And I want to remind everyone, keep asking why.